This sermon is part of Mosaic's Unlimited Campaign, a two-year campaign to become resilient in your faith and radical in your generosity, a two-year commitment to make a two-decade impact in your heart and in the state of Maryland. You can catch up on previous weeks and find more resources for this campaign at mosaicchristian.org. In October 1957, The USA watched as Russia sent Sputnik into outer space, the very first satellite in human history. Less than two years after that, Russia sent Luna 1 past the moon and got photos of the moon, the first of its kind. And then less than two years after that, the Russians sent Yuri Gagarin into outer space, becoming the first man in space ever. The USA was losing in the race to space, and JFK wasn't too excited about it. So, in May of 1961, JFK stood before Congress and said, Before the decade is over, we will send a man to the moon. And I, I can't do an impression, but you get it. That's, he he kind of sounded like that. And he said this without knowing how to get there, but sure enough, in July of 1969, 16 days after celebrating Independence Day as a nation, Neil Armstrong took that USA flag and planted it on the moon, and we had officially won the quest for the cosmos. Now, there's a lot of crazy things I could talk about related to our nation's journey to the moon, but what stands out to me as a leader is how JFK stood there in front of a nation and said, hey, y'all, here's where we're going, even though I have no idea how we're getting there. Like, that's crazy talk as a leader. At the time of his big declaration, we were not winning the race to space. Uh, It took six years for Apollo 1 to go down, and if you remember, the entire rocket caught fire and everyone died. Didn't go well. We had seamstresses trying to figure out how to make a spacesuit where an astronaut's eyeballs wouldn't get sucked from his sockets. And at the time of the announcement, we did not have the technology to launch something into space that could then land and then launch again, and then enter people into the human atmosphere without being burned alive. We did not have the technology. So putting a man on the moon, when JFK said this, was nothing more than a wish. That is, until a group of people dedicated themselves to turning that dream into a reality. There's a fascinating book called Team Moon, written by a historian, and she wrote, in order for those three men to land on the moon, It took the blood, sweat, and tears of about 400,000 people. Think about that. 400,000 people working for almost a decade so that a couple names would be remembered on the moon. uh, In her book, she talks about how at the time of the Apollo missions, there were 17,000 engineers, mechanics, and soldiers working on the project. There was a 24-year-old whiz kid from Texas who was solving computer glitches while the lunar module was landing on the moon, and it took about 500 people to develop a spacesuit that actually worked. And what I love about all of this is what was infinitely out of reach became possible because people rallied together to do what they could with grit, passion, and urgency. Famously, after we landed on the moon, one of the great astronauts of the 1960s, Jim Lovell, said this, from now on, we live in a world where man has walked on the moon. It wasn't a miracle, we just decided to go. And it's a powerful phrase because what was deemed impossible became a reality because a nameless army of 400,000 people simply chose to do their part and accomplish the mission. And this idea of what can happen through a faithful group is a driving force behind the Unlimited Campaign. If you're new or haven't really been around the last couple weeks, you should know this is week four of a series that's launching us into a two-year faith and generosity campaign. where We've been trying to take the lid off of what could be in our hearts and what could be through our church as we seek to make a greater difference in the state of Maryland over the long haul. Our guiding verse has come from Ephesians 3, verses 16 and 20 that says, I pray from God's glorious unlimited resources that he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. And today, I wanna continue down this passage and look at what would it look like for a group of people to pursue the infinitely more of what God could have in store when we do our part faithfully to run after a burden that Jesus has put on our hearts as a community. The truth is this place is filled with stories that seemed impossible until they weren't. 
And we're gonna get to experience some of those stories a little bit later today. But we've been running after this goal to become unlimited as a church because we, could, we see this opportunity right now as investing two years of sacrifice into two decades uh, of impact in our state. And it's why our unlimited goal has been to raise three to six million above normal giving over 25 months. And this will go to eliminating our $5 million mortgage a year that would free up hundreds of thousands of dollars every year to minister to people in fresh ways. This would enable us to run after immediate local missions efforts in West Baltimore through 1012 Sports, and it's gonna help us open up to what God wants to do when we learn to trust him with what we have. There's a deep work, we talked all about this last week, there's a deep work that goes down when we trust God with what we have. And the good news for us is there's already a ton of momentum. Last week I shared with you those faithful families who wanted to go first and offered an upfront cash gift to kind of kickstart everything. Um, as of right now, that group of families have now committed upfront cash, not their 25 month total, just upfront cash total of $1.3 million already, which is great. Our CFO is excited about that. I appreciate that. There you go. This is an incredible number from people who want to go first and challenge us to match them with their passion and urgency. And if you missed last week, please hear me. If you don't love Jesus and you don't trust Mosaic or you don't know what you think about me as a leader or you just don't have joy in your heart at the prospect of giving, the Bible says do not give. So there's no pressure here. You're not being coerced. Scripture says do not be emotionally manipulated or coerced into giving above what brings joy to your heart. So if that's you and you're not interested, we're not after your money. God doesn't want your money. But if you do call Mosaic home, and you believe in the vision and mission of this place, I am up here challenging you to step up and step into courageous giving to the point that it stirs up faith in your heart and risk in your gut because on the other side of your generosity, lives will be changed and hope may be found. So in the next installment of this series, I want us to look at the infinitely more God may have in store and capture our imagination for what can happen when people come together to discover is the impossible potentially possible in our time. And we're gonna do this by looking at a passage from the Gospel of Mark. It's one of the four biographies of Jesus' life found in the New Testament. And we're gonna read about a group of friends who do just that and see how they teach us what it looks like for us to be people who run after the infinitely more that God might have for us. Here's Mark chapter two, verse one to three. When Jesus returned to Capernaum several days later, the news spread quickly that he was back home. Soon, the house where he was staying was so packed with visitors that there was no more room, even outside the door. While he was preaching God's word to them, four men arrived carrying a paralyzed man on a mat. Now, a lot of you who maybe grew up in church are familiar with this story, but we gotta park the bus a little bit because there's some really significant things that we can already extrapolate from the text. Uh, first, these guys are carrying this friend and they're likely in a relationship with them because in the ancient Jewish world, if you were paralyzed like this, it was viewed as being punishment for something you did or something your ancestors did. And you would have normally not been really welcome in social environments. So these men clearly had a relationship with them. They cared about them and they wanted to help them. They'd seen him languish on his own for years. They're trying to do something about it. Then these men catch wind that Jesus is back in town and there's all these rumors that like this man from Nazareth can heal people. And so for a moment, these faithful friends think maybe the impossible could happen. Maybe this man's paralysis doesn't have to be his forever. And they don't know what's gonna happen when their friend gets in front of Jesus, but they know their next step is to get him in a room face to face with Jesus Christ. So they grab the mat that he's on, which would have been nothing more than a blanket or some like tightly wound hemp or something, and they carry him on foot in the first century to this dude's house. And when they get there, it's so crowded that they can see it's packed because there's, there's no room at the front door. They can see that from afar, which is telling to me because how many of you are like me? When you go somewhere and there's a long line, you know you're not going there. You're turning around. You know what I'm saying? Like I went to Gaber Farms with my family. I wanted to turn around immediately. There were so many cars there. I'm not a monster. I let my kids pick pumpkins, but everything in me wanted to leave right away. These guys see a line and they're like, no, we're still going. And it says they couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd. So they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Again, we read the Bible, we think, oh, this is cute. This was not cute. This was destruction of property. This is like a misdemeanor, okay? Like back then, 
Roofs were built with logs and sticks. Then they'd bake clay and put them on top like bricks. Then they'd lay a live active vegetation on top so the roots and the vines would strengthen it all. And scholars say in this part of the world, at this time in the world, roofs were about two feet thick of like living vegetation. So I want you just to imagine US, you RSVP to the Bible study. You, you got there early. You've been waiting for Jesus. He shows up. You have a good seat. You're listening to him preach the word. And then all of a sudden, sticks start falling on your face. And then on your cute little, you know, Bible devotional thing, bricks of clay start falling. And then you look up and a dude is being lowered through some sort of contraption. And then you see the four heads of these guys being like, oh, my bad, guys. We just weren't going to let some formalities in a roof get in the way of our friend meeting Jesus. You understand. Like, that's what's happening here. Like at Mosaic, we work really hard to create distraction-free environments, you know? Here, this was anything but that. Like this was not distraction-free. So they lower the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of the religious law were sitting there and thought to themselves, what is he saying? This is blasphemy. Only God can forgive sins. Jesus knew immediately what they were thinking, so he asked them, why do you question this in your hearts? Is it easier to say to the paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or stand up, pick up your mat, and walk? So I will prove to you that the Son of Man has the authority on earth to forgive sins. Then Jesus turned to the paralyzed man and said, stand up, pick up your mat, and go home. And the man jumped up, grabbed his mat, and walked out through the stunned onlookers. They were all amazed and praised God, exclaiming, we've never seen anything like this before. Translation, we just saw the impossible take place. We just saw a guy do something that we wouldn't have even thought to ask or imagine, but we've witnessed it here in this place. And this story is an illustration of what can happen when people have urgency in their bones and deep faith in their hearts. And all of that coming together when Jesus is present to minister to those who think they are too far gone. So, looking at the example of these friends, I want to point out three truths that are true for us as we try to be people who ask God to do infinitely more in our hearts, through our church, and through this campaign. First comes from uh, verse 4. They couldn't bring him to Jesus because of the crowd, so they dug a hole through the roof above his head. Then they lowered the man on his mat right down in front of Jesus. What this reveals to me, uh, as I've observed this, is I don't think these guys were carrying their friend alone just on a mat. I think they probably brought some gear with them too because remember, they had to dig through two feet of like vine and stone and brick and all sorts of stuff and then they had to make some sort of contraption to lower the body. I don't think they just dangled homie with the ankles and said, hey Jesus, bless our guy real quick. They lowered him somehow that was safe. And, and what this moment kind of reveals is that seeing God do the impossible requires desperation and preparation. These men were likely desperate to help their friend. They were clearly emotionally stirred to do something for him, but this miracle happens not just because they have bleeding hearts, but because they had thoughtful heads and gritty hands who were willing to prepare and experience a miracle of God by stepping out in faith. And this campaign, in a way, is all about that. As we continue to grow as a church, and as we seek to meet some of the deep needs in our state, this campaign is about preparing for our future and maximizing the impact of God through this church. We're preparing for what we think he is calling us into over the next two decades. Jesus himself taught that preparation is essential for stepping into what God has for you. Here's what he says in Luke 14. Don't begin until you count the cost. He's all about preparation. For who would begin construction of a building without first calculating the cost to see if there's enough money to finish it? You and I know we live in an age of instant gratification. Like every ad that pops up on your Insta or social isn't really saying, hey, do you want this? Let's wait four weeks, even if you can't afford it. Let's just do a payment plan right now. Let's get it as fast as possible. We live in an instant gratification motivation economy. But if you take a step back and look at some of the moments that God has worked the most in your life, I would all but bet it never occurred quickly. It required desperation on your part and patience and perseverance and prep to encounter the greater story that God wanted to do in your life. 
And these men model that. They put in work that led to life change. They were desperate for him, but also prepared to participate in that story. And on the other side, they experienced in their own way an infinitely more that goes beyond what they would have even asked at the start. Because not only did his legs get healed, but his sins were forgiven. Now that's the first truth from our pastors. The sexual, second one comes from the mentality that the, these guys embodied. A lot of the time when you and I are confronted with risk in faith, we think, okay, what would you do? What would I do to grow? But these guys embody something a little bit different than challenges us that we've actually seen modeled by people in our church. Because I think the better question to consider is not what would you do, but what wouldn't you do? If it meant you could see God move powerfully in your life. Whenever you've taken a bold step to follow Jesus, even if it's just to show up at church for the first time, you've been asking this kind of question. Like, what wouldn't you do if it meant you could confront the dysfunction that has been leading you into a very dark place? For some of you, the thing that you just thought I would never do is go to a church. And then you found yourself in a place like this with all of these people trying to figure out how do I reconcile the pain of my life and the goodness that we sing about at church. Some of you, it's been that. For some of you, what wouldn't you do? That question is what got you to confront the shame that you've carried for years whether it's self-harm or sexual abuse or, or sin that you did 10 years ago that you were carrying around alone. You got to a point where what wouldn't I do to deal with this? And you started to confess it to friends or you got into a group or you went to therapy. For some of you, that question of what wouldn't I do is how you gave your life to Jesus because you're willing to dethrone yourself off of the altar of your heart and say, Jesus, I'm putting you there instead. At the core of our bold steps with faith, it's not just I want to do something, it's what wouldn't I do? to see God meet me. And it's why if you've never made a decision to follow Jesus, but you just saw Nick get baptized and something is stirring within you and realizing I'm at the end of my rope and I need help, check the baptism box today. We'll call you this week about what does it mean to walk in that grace and that truth and experience a peace that surpasses understanding. Check the box, even if you're not totally sure, we'll call you, we'll walk with you and figure things out with you in your journey towards Christ. But that question that these guys embodies, what wouldn't you do, is significant for us and really behind the campaign is our deeper burden to reach the lost and help the hurting. And so again, the question I ask is, what wouldn't you do if it all but guaranteed that friend or family member who is languishing in sin could experience forgiveness and wholeness in Christ? The men in our passage put their faith in action. They decided that their friend's healing was more important than this guy's roof. I'm not saying go destroy property, but you get the point. They decided Maybe they had to stay and work and fix it for free. That was worth seeing their friends' healing and sins be forgiven. The social stigma of being the disruptors was worth the potential of what can happen when you get your friend face-to-face -face with Jesus. And over the last few weeks, all that we've been talking about, putting our faith on display through radical generosity, all of this is being done so we can meet the physical and spiritual needs of our time. I was working on this and trying to figure out how to put some like language to this point and, and help us understand how significant this is and then God in his brilliance surprised us in a really big way. Because on Wednesday, I'm working on this sermon with our sermon team and uh, my executive assistant comes into my office and says, you're not gonna believe this. Someone just showed up to Mosaic crying and our staff had popped up and tried to care for her and say what's going on and she walks into the reception desk and she says, I've got friends who don't know Jesus and I wanna help us reach more people but I don't have much and she's crying. And I'm like, okay. She said, I don't have much but I do have this and she plops a $4,000 Louis Vuitton bag on the counter. And she says, will you help me sell this? Because I don't have anything else. I don't even know why I have this. I shouldn't have bought it. But would you help me sell this so I can give to the campaign because I want to reach my friends and my family? She embodied the attitude of not what should you do, but what wouldn't you do if it meant you could reach that person you love with the grace and truth of Jesus. Hold that person in front of your mind now that you're thinking about, you pray about, you know this is true. What wouldn't you do is the better question to ask. And next week is Commitment Sunday where we're gonna be coming in with our commitment cards. If, if you call Mosaic home and you're all in on this church and, and you've got joy in your heart for giving, I'm challenging everybody to come in next Sunday with this commitment card filled out. And we've got three sort of hallways to help you process. These, these aren't boxes for you to check, they're hallways to help you process. But this slot right here is a courageous gift. We're challenging people to give a large upfront gift to kickstart the campaign. For some of you, we're challenging you to give the largest single check you've ever written in Mosaic. 
Uh, then you'd have the consistent gift, which is a monthly gift above and beyond what you normally give. And the good news is 25-month campaign means a little bit, becomes a lot over a long period of time. And then last, we have the creative gift here. And that's where people in our church already are given Louis Vuitton bags and they're selling bass guitars. Um, someone uh, is selling stocks from a company that they had invested in. These are all non-cash gifts that people are doing. And then at the bottom, the total unlimited commitment is the sum of those three things. And my hope is that this week, you keep this commitment card that's in your unlimited guide, you keep it around. And you look at it and you pray about it and you, you, you wrestle with it. And then next week on Commitment Sunday, we'll have a moment here where you'll get to come to the front and everyone will be moving, no one's gonna be watching you. And you put your commitment in the box as an act of faith. And you say, God, I'm trusting that you're gonna do more with my bit than I could do by myself to reach the lost and help the hurting. I wanna share with you briefly me and my wife's story uh, when it comes to giving for this campaign. Um, Our journey to kind of figure out what we wanted to give began last year. Um, In January of this year, you might remember during our soundtrack series, I told a story how I goofed up some tax forms and I didn't feel like a real man. Some of you remember this. You can tell I'm very excited to share this news with you. But I had four years worth of tax returns coming my way. I'd filed for them like an adjustment in my taxes. It's kind of boring. But I was banking on four years worth of tax returns coming my way this year. In December, I found out I had ruined some of the paperwork. And so instead of getting all that money, one of the years I owed several thousand dollars. If you wanna feel small as a man, get your wife really excited about a large sum of money and then find out it's not coming and have to tell her and tell her it's your fault. And because of that, I didn't feel like a real man. I thought a real man would know how to fix this and I didn't know how to fix it. And so I was just spiraling in December, in January of this year. Now, thankfully I took care of that one little problem. So at the end of that, I still had three years worth of tax returns coming. But have any of you ever just tried to get a hold of the IRS before? Yeah, not fun. It's like calling a girl who doesn't want to go out on homecoming, but you think she might, so you just call and call and call and call. That's what I was doing. I got no results. And so, really, to be honest, this financial thing was the single source of anxiety, the greatest source of anxiety in my life for like the last three and a half years. And so all year, we're just, I'm I'm hoping this money comes in, and we're really excited about the money to come in. We've got three small kids, and we have a, a, a townhouse that's great, but it's got no yard and our kids are almost seven, five, and three, and that many kids in the house, you don't get a lot of alone time as a parent. So we were really hoping to get these funds, put it towards a down payment for a house, and move to a house with a yard. So we're praying, we're praying, we're praying, we're really excited, we got all these ideas for it, and nothing's happening. And then this summer, uh, during my study break, actually, where I got a couple weeks off from preaching, during that time of prayer and just extended quiet with God, I got the sense that, that God was kind of saying to me, John, you know, you don't have to worry about this. Like, I'm gonna take care of you, right? And I was like, yeah, God, I know. And then I felt like he was saying, you know, like, you did the right thing. Like, that money's gonna come in. You're gonna be okay, right? And I'm like, yeah, I know. And then, like, within the same week, I felt like God was saying, hey, John, you know I'm gonna bring that money to you, right? I'm like, yeah. But you know I'm gonna bring it to you just in time for the campaign, right? And I was like, yeah, I know. (laughs) And sure enough, almost to the day, one month before Unlimited began, three years worth of tax returns hit our checking account from the IRS. And I told my wife, and she basically said, you know what this means, right? And I was like, yep. And so after praying and processing and freaking out a little bit, we decided we're gonna give the entirety of that return, all three years worth, as our courageous gift to the campaign. Because as much as that money would help us get into a house, and as much as that money makes me feel like a real man, what we want most is for other people to have a spiritual home like we have here. And for other men to be raised up in the image of Jesus to know that their sonship with Christ is what defines them as a man, not what they earn, not what they make, and not what someone pays them. And I don't tell you this to get wrapped up in the size of things or the numbers, but just to help you see that whatever it is the Lord is calling you to give, it's not about the numbers, it's about the faith those numbers represent. And there are people who are gonna give way less who are taking an incredible risk of faith. Jesus honors the woman who gave two coins as the one who will inherit the kingdom of God. But I tell you that story about our journey of giving so that you know next week when we come up here and we hand in our card with great fear and excitement and nerves and the whoop feeling, you know, when you write a big check, we're gonna hand in the largest check we've ever written to the church along with the monthly gift above our normal tithe and a creative thing that we don't even know what it's gonna bring in, but we're doing it as an act of faith to remind ourselves that when we fund God's mission, that's the best thing we do with our money. And I've got people in my life I've been praying for for 12 years to come to Christ. 
and they have it. But when I give to Mosaic, I'm reminded somebody, somebody gets in that tub. It may not be mine, but somebody, somebody is giving their life to Christ. And that's what stirs my confidence to take steps. That's why you are giving sacrificially. The stories we've heard have been incredible. It's because you know when you say yes to the faith action step God has put before you, he does the infinitely more that we long for. And the third truth we see from this passage just affirms all of this. The truth is your faith is a factor in the salvation of others. It's crazy to think about that your faith, you can't save other people with your faith, but your faith is a factor in the salvation of other people. Look at verse five again. It says, seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, my child, your sins are forgiven. These men took a risk. They carried him all that way. They lowered him through the roof. They said, we believe Jesus could heal you, and they put their body into action to display it. And from that faith on display, Jesus looks at them and says, hey, because of their faith, because of your faith, this man doesn't just have his legs healed. His sins are forgiven. And this story is a sobering reminder that your faith and my faith and what we lean into what God has put before us plays an incredible role in the flourishing and forgiveness of other people. Because your faith plays a role in the salvation of other people, that's why, ultimately, why you give to a church. It's why you serve on a weekend serving team. That's why you do a, a prayer walk on Route 1. It's why you study the scriptures and not deviate from them. It's why you confess sin to friends and you get into community. It's why you try to live on mission and get to know your neighbors because your faith is a factor in the eternity of others. And ultimately, this truth is why 16 years ago, Mosaic was planted. It's why a small group of people committed to being a church for people who don't go to church and started holding services in a movie theater in the Arundel Mills Mall. Theater 19 is where we met. And it was because we have this deep conviction that what we do with what God has put before us plays a part in the eternity and salvation of others. And what's crazy to me is that in those early days at the movie theater, just a ragtag group of people trying to reach the lost and help the hurting, in those early days, there was a young couple that came to Mosaic named Brandon and Jess. And they weren't really following Jesus yet, and they were open to going to a church for unchurchy people, but they started attending Mosaic. And what God began through those early folks in the life of Brandon and Jess laid a foundation of the gospel that, lead, that led to one of the most powerful stories to ever happen in our church. Watch this. So we have been coming to Mosaic for a little over 15 years. It felt like our life was still continuing with some of the things we were doing before, but it was more enriched because it's like our family was growing with our friends. Wow. <laughs> There's one last present wow. under the tree and it said to Lily from Santa. You know what that means? Lily, come here. You know what that means? That means you're gonna be a big sister. And it was a book that said, I'm gonna be a big sister. I mean, I had such a textbook pregnancy with Lily, mm -hmm. um, so I was excited to be pregnant again, and it was pretty normal, you know, leading up in, until our 20-week um, appointment, which is like the big appointment where you do the anatomy scan to find out if you're having a boy or girl, amongst other things, they're checking out at that appointment. So what happened next? We, um, I remember we went as a family because we were just excited to find out all together. Just remember him saying that our baby has a rare, um, a, a rare disorder that is not compatible with life and that there is no chance of survival. And these are your options. And the options were not anything that I wanted to hear. He said, you, you need to terminate this pregnancy. That's the right thing to do. Why don't you want to do that? Do you think God, are you, are you religious? Are you a Christian? Do you think God will be mad at you if you do this? Because he won't be mad at you. This is a, this is an exception. You can, 
he won't be mad at you if you do this. You should do this. So I felt her kicking me and I'm like, I can't, like, I'm, she's safe right now. Like, I'm not going to hurt my, my baby. Like, I'm not going to do that. Like, I'm sorry. Like, God's going to have to take over at this point. I'm going to do my best and make, um, we're going to make the decision to carry her. Definitely remember asking God why and just being being afraid that I wouldn't be strong enough to get through it. We're just going to be stewards and celebrate her life and just take care of her as much as we could with the time we we're giving her. Our community, or whatever they could do, they just wanted to be near. It's they, not like they just asked, like, what do you need? Like, they just did it. They didn't wait for us to ask. Just being really grateful for life in general. Like, you know what? Yes, our daughter's life will likely be short, shorter than I would have ever imagined, but she's still worthy to be celebrated to be loved, to be cared for, and I'm her mother, and as her mother, I'm gonna do just that. You're displaying how someone could hold grief and gratitude in the same. Mm -hmm. We went to Krispy Kreme, and I remember setting one of the donuts on my belly, and it's one of my favorite photos. A couple hours later, I still didn't feel great. I knew, in the back of my head, I knew, and I was not ready for it. I want to say I pushed twice and she was here. I remember hearing her and being just so grateful that they were wrong. Like she was here and like my daughter is alive and I get to meet her. Brandon gets to meet her and hold her. I've been carrying her. He gets to hold her. How long did you have together? Um, a little over an hour. How long did it feel? Like forever. <laughs> yeah. Ew. I know that I'll see my little girl again. And that, that keeps me going. I always say Nora is our daily reminder of uh, the hope of heaven. I just don't know how people go through something like this without a, a community that is surrounding them. And there was a nurse that was about to end her shift, came in to talk to us to tell us that there was someone else coming in after her. And then she said, okay, and I just wanna say to you, what I have witnessed here I've never seen anything like this before. You guys are gonna be okay. These people that we have seen come in and out of these doors all day long, I think you guys have support. That the sharing of our story can help others because you can't go through this alone. You're not supposed to go through this life alone because that, that pain, it stays with you. That hurt stays with you. But having that community to be there, that stays with you too. When you guys think about that phrase, like dreaming again, 
What does that mean to you? What is God stirring within you? Here we are seven years later, and one thing that hasn't really gone away is our desire to want to love another child. Mm -hmm. And I think God is leading us down a path of um, seeing what it would look like for us to um, foster. Brandon and Jess wrote a letter this week adding one last thing they wanted to share with you. They said, with much prayer and the Holy Spirit's leading, it has become clear to us that God has laid a new purpose on our hearts to become foster parents, to serve and love children right here in our community who need happy, healthy, and loving homes. They said, quote, we know this chapter will not be easy and has great potential to expose us to a different kind of pain and heartache, but we move forward with confidence in our community, in Jesus, and the courage he provides along the way. If you're grateful for Brandon and Jess sharing their story for us, would you uh, give it up for them real quick? If you're like me, throughout this campaign, there's been a little voice in the back of your head wondering, like, what's really at risk if we don't do this, you know? Like, what, what, <clears throat> what's really going to happen if Mosaic is an unlimited as a church? I want you to imagine what Brandon and Jessica's life would be like if they did not have a gospel-centered community. If they didn't have a place rooted in vulnerability if they didn't have friends who weren't afraid of deep pain, if they didn't have friends who could hold faith and grief together, what would it be like to face that kind of hurt without hope? I want you to picture that, and now I want you to remember that that hypothetical is exactly what people face every single day who live without Jesus Christ. It's there every day. And by God's grace, we get to play a part in whether or not that continues. Given our history as a church, given the power of stories like this, given what he is already doing in our community, we refuse to settle. And when we see stories like Brandon and Jess and others in this room, we are reminded that the impossible becomes possible when God's people do their part and point others to Jesus Christ. The impossible becomes possible when God's people do their part and simply point others to Jesus. And to end, we're gonna close with a song, but it's also gonna be a moment where you and I get to be reminded that we are witnesses of a move of God right now that goes beyond our understanding. And my hope is from this moment, you and I are reminded of what can happen when a nameless army does its part and proclaims the grace and truth of Jesus into a world that's desperate for it. Because on the other side are stories that are infinitely more than we would even think to pray for. I want to invite you to stand and then we'll pray together to close out. Go ahead and stand right now. Heavenly Father, thank you for Brandon and Jess. Thanks for Lily. Thanks for little Nora. And God, thank you that in incredibly difficult stories like this, we get to uncover the truth of your word where you promise that you work all things for the good of those who love you according to your purposes, God. Thank you that Nora teaches us to cling to that truth in unimaginable pain. And God, my prayer right now is that you would posture our hearts towards you to hold both the unanswered prayers and the incredible blessing of who you are and what you've done for us, Jesus so that as witnesses of what you have already done, it spurs us to fresh risk and fresh faith to see you do infinitely more in such a way that it marks our time and our state 
forever. We love you, Jesus. In your name I pray. Amen.
After landing on the moon in 1969, that astronaut said, it wasn't a miracle, we just decided to go. I was like, this is a miracle. But what will determine whether we continue to see stories like this is whether we choose to say yes to what the Lord has put before us. And our, our challenge and our invitation is in light of this history, in light of all that God has done, will you step in with fresh faith and fresh risk to see the gospel of Jesus unleashed so we can see thousand more stories like this? It is the honor of a lifetime to be on mission with you. I, I deeply love you and I'm humbled by you and I'm praying for you this week because I can't wait to see what God does among us and within us and through us on Commitment Sunday and beyond. We love you. Have a great week. Let's give it up for them one more time.